Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear stories from Mario Ritter, Susan Shand, and Brian Lynn. Later, Kelly Jean Kelly will present America's Presidents. But first, the Museum of the Bible opened in November 2017 in Washington, D.C. Even then, some questioned whether its collection of 16 Dead Sea Scrolls were real versions of the religious texts. Now, the museum admits that at least five of its scroll pieces are fake. A team of German researchers used technology to identify the false texts. The announcement has serious effects for the Bible Museum and other Christian individuals and organizations. Jeffrey Kloha is the chief curator for the Museum of the Bible. In a statement, he said that the findings are a chance to educate the public on the importance of making sure that rare biblical objects are real. He added that the museum was committed to being honest about the situation. The scrolls are a collection of ancient Jewish religious texts. They were first discovered in the 1940s near the Dead Sea in what is now Israel. The documents are believed to date back to the first century, near the time some say Jesus was alive. Researchers believe the total collection includes more than 9,000 documents and 50,000 pieces. Most of the scrolls and pieces are closely controlled by the Israeli Antiquities Authority. But around 2002, new pieces began to appear on the market. Bible experts became concerned. They warned that these pieces were designed to appeal to American evangelical Christians. That appears to be exactly what happened. One religious school in Texas and an evangelical college in California reportedly paid millions of dollars to buy what they thought were pieces of the scrolls. The Green family also bought pieces of the scrolls. The Greens are wealthy evangelical Christians and the main financial supporter of the Museum of the Bible. In the years before the museum opened, the family bought many ancient objects. Now it appears the Greens mistakenly bought some not-so-ancient objects, too. Associated Press reporter Ashraf Khalil called the situation a massive case of archaeological fraud. China has opened the world's longest sea-crossing bridge and tunnel. The structure links Hong Kong and China's industrial Pearl River Delta area. Chinese President Xi Jinping declared the Hong Kong Zhuhai Macau Bridge open on Tuesday. The bridge is actually both a bridge and tunnel system that involves man made islands. The combined length of the project is nearly 40 kilometers, depending on the starting point used. The sea bridge took almost 10 years to build. It cost the Chinese government an estimated $20 billion. 
The project was expected to be completed in 2016, but building problems and extra costs delayed the opening. The tunnel section of the system is designed to permit ocean-going ships to enter the Pearl River. The new link will reduce travel time between Hong Kong and the Pearl River area from several hours to about 30 minutes. The Pearl River area in Guangdong province has been a center of economic development in China for 40 years. The bridge also links Hong Kong and the mainland to another former colony, Macau, which is famous for its casinos. The bridge is a symbolic link between Hong Kong and mainland China. Britain handed over control of Hong Kong to mainland China in 1997, but the two sides agreed that the territory would continue to have its own legal and economic system for 50 years. The so-called One Country, Two Systems Agreement is to last until 2047. The completion of the project also has political importance for Xi's administration. Mainland China has opposed protests and expressions of civil liberties that are guaranteed under Hong Kong law. The completion of the Hong Kong Zhuhai Macau Bridge follows the opening of a new high speed rail line linking Hong Kong and the mainland. Claudia Mo is a Hong Kong politician. She told the Associated Press that the bridge is mostly of political importance. She said, it's not exactly necessary because Hong Kong is connected to mainland China in every way already, by land, by air, by sea. Media reports say the bridge will also use high technology devices, including a facial recognition system used to find especially sleepy drivers. Rules on the use of the bridge are still being considered. Reuters reports that private vehicles will need special permits to use the bridge. I'm Mario Ritter. Turkey's president says Saudi officials plotted for days to kill reporter Jamal Khashoggi in Saudi Arabia's diplomatic offices in Istanbul. On Tuesday, President Recep Tayyip Erdogan spoke to Turkey's parliament about the incident believed to have happened on October 2nd. Erdogan refused to accept Saudi Arabia's explanation that the Saudi journalist was accidentally killed. Erdogan also demanded that the Saudis tell him the names of every person involved. Erdogan said he wants Saudi Arabia to send 18 suspects to Turkey for a trial. The Saudi government has arrested 18 men in connection to the killing and said it is carrying out an investigation. Saudi Arabia has described the suspects as rogue operators, but reports have linked Saudi Arabia's Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman to the killing. 
To blame such an incident on security and intelligence members would not satisfy us or the international community, Erdogan said in a speech to Parliament. The Turkish president said Saudi Arabia admitted to the killing. He said he expects the 18 will be brought to justice. He used the word murder 15 times in his speech to Parliament. The Associated Press reports that a U.S. official who refused to be identified by name said CIA Director Gina Haspel is in Turkey to discuss the case. U.S. President Donald Trump also has said he is not satisfied with the explanations from Saudi Arabia about the death. Khashoggi was a writer for the Washington Post newspaper and a critic of the Saudi government. Erdogan did not blame Crown Prince Mohammed by name in his speech. However, he kept pressure on the Saudi government with his demands for the Saudi suspects. Calling Khashoggi the victim of a savage murder, Erdogan said that ignoring the murder would hurt the human conscience. Erdogan said 15 Saudi officials arrived in the country before Khashoggi's death. He also said a man wore Khashoggi's clothes and walked out of the diplomatic office, possibly as a decoy. We are seeking answers. Who did these people get their orders from to go to Turkey? Erdogan asked. International attention increased after Saudi Arabia said on Saturday that Khashoggi died in a fight. The case has shocked people around the world. At a government meeting Tuesday, King Salman again said that Saudi Arabia would hold those responsible for Khashoggi's death accountable. The state-run Saudi press agency reported his comments. Saudi Arabia said it has arrested suspects and dismissed several important intelligence officials. Critics believe the arrests were a way to cover up the responsibility of Crown Prince Mohammed. I'm Susan Shand. A new study has found that young babies learning languages through video materials do better with other babies around than they do alone. The study confirms earlier studies that found a child's learning can be greatly improved when it happens together with another child. The study was published earlier this month in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. It included United States-based researchers from the University of Connecticut and the University of Washington. In general, very young children are able to learn languages much faster than older children or adults. But researchers say there are still many unanswered questions for why this happens. In the new study, researchers wanted to build on earlier studies that looked at the effectiveness of using video material in language learning for very young children. Past research has shown that a young child's learning level using video is very low compared to language spoken in a live presentation by humans. One of the earlier studies measured the progress of nine-month-old children who listened to Mandarin Chinese during a series of visits to a learning laboratory. The children heard the language presented in three different ways. 
Some received a live social presentation. Others watched a video recording of the live social presentation. A third group listened to an audio-only recording of the live presentation. The study measured the ability of the children to recognize differences in Mandarin speech sounds that they heard. The children who listened to recorded Mandarin did not experience the same learning progress as those who received a live social presentation. Those results suggested that the language learning process does not require long-term listening and is enhanced by social interaction, the study stated. In the new study, researchers wanted to see if language learning through video would be improved if the child went through the process with another child instead of by themselves. The experiment involved nine-month-old children who listened to Mandarin language videos. This time, the children were permitted to interact with a video screen. The children could touch different parts of the screen to control the presentation of Mandarin video clips they saw. The researchers noted that the babies were quick to learn that touching the screen would activate a video. The researchers watched the children for signs of behavioral and brain reactions to measure their skill level of processing language sounds. They reported finding brain-based evidence that clearly showed a higher level of language learning among the children who took part in the experiment with another child. In addition, the study found that putting the children together with new, unfamiliar partners led to even higher learning results. Patricia Kuhl co-led the study. She is a professor at the University of Washington and heads the Bezos Family Foundation for Early Childhood Learning. She told Science Daily that the study demonstrates the importance of working with a social partner to improve language learning. Working with others, even at such a young age, increases arousal, which in turn leads to increased learning, Kuhl said. Social partners not only provide information by showing us how to do things, but also provide motivation for learning, she added. The researchers said the results show that the increased learning only appeared related to the social interaction between children. They did not find clear links between higher learning levels and the amount of viewing time or number of videos watched. Learning improvement was also not directly affected by how many times the screen was touched or how much movement ability a child had, the study found. I'm Brian Lynn. VOA Learning English presents America's Presidents. Today we are talking about Woodrow Wilson. He served two terms, from 1913 to 1921, and led the United States through the First World War. Wilson might have seemed an unlikely war president. He was a university professor before he entered politics. And when the conflict began in Europe in 1914, Wilson strongly rejected the idea of the U.S. getting involved. He even campaigned for his second term on the slogan, He Kept Us Out of the War. But Wilson's idealism eventually made him believe the U.S. must enter the conflict. He famously said, 
the world must be safe for democracy. He spent the last months of his presidency fighting to create a League of Nations that would prevent future wars. Wilson did not succeed in that effort, but the effects of his presidency are still seen today in both the domestic and foreign affairs of the United States. Woodrow Wilson was born in the state of Virginia in 1856 and grew up in the South. Wilson's father was a Protestant Christian minister who supported the views of the Confederacy during the Civil War. Wilson's mother had been born in England, but raised in the United States. She was reportedly warm and loving, especially to her husband and four children. Wilson's early life was marked by poor health and a passion for learning. His education included tutoring by Confederate soldiers, classes with his father, a year at Davidson College, a bachelor's degree from the school now called Princeton, one year of law school, and a doctoral degree in history and political science from the University of Johns Hopkins. He remains, so far, the only president with a Ph.D. Wilson's academic interests were in government and how it could be most effective. Even as a young man, he supported the idea of a strong executive, either a prime minister or a president. He wrote a number of books, including a biography of George Washington and a history of the United States. He also taught popular classes at several colleges, including Bryn Mawr in Pennsylvania, Wesleyan in Connecticut, and Princeton in New Jersey. In time, Wilson became the president of Princeton. He made major reforms to the school until some faculty and alumni resisted his efforts. Wilson had always been interested in political power. The Democratic Party in New Jersey became interested in Wilson when they were looking for a candidate with an honest public image. In truth, party officials believed he would be a weak leader whom they could influence. Wilson surprised them by winning the seat as New Jersey governor easily and then rejecting their efforts to control him. He went on to pass major reform legislation in New Jersey that reduced corruption and protected the rights of workers. His actions drew the attention of Democratic Party leaders seeking a candidate for president in 1912. Voters did not overwhelmingly choose Wilson in 1912. Although he did well in the Electoral College, he earned only a little more than 40% of the popular vote. Other votes were mostly divided between two former presidents, Theodore Roosevelt and William Taft. Yet, Wilson quickly asserted authority over Congress and pushed through a number of laws aimed at dramatic reform. Historian Kendrick Clements at the University of South Carolina says, Wilson had a strongly progressive vision. He was interested in expanding economic opportunity for people at the bottom of society and eliminating special privileges enjoyed by the richest and most powerful members of society. One of Wilson's most important acts was to create a new federal agency called the Federal Reserve Board. It still regulates American banks, credit, and money supply. He also created the Federal Trade Commission to ensure fair business practices. 
and the Department of Labor to protect workers' rights. And he supported laws to reduce working hours for railroad employees, bar child labor, and offer government loans to farmers. But even during Wilson's busy lawmaking, the threat of world war demanded his attention. Wilson had declared that the U.S. would remain neutral in the growing conflict between the Allied and Central Powers. One of his reasons was that people in the U.S. were immigrants from the countries that were at war. Wilson did not want the conflict to divide Americans. However, he permitted international trade, including with Britain and France. As a result, many believed the U.S. was favoring those countries. In 1915, a German submarine sank a British ship called the Lusitania and killed more than 100 Americans on board. Wilson protested several times to Germany about the sinking. He warned that the U.S. would not accept another such aggression. But two years later, Germany attacked U.S. commercial ships. It also invited Mexico to enter into an alliance against the United States. At the beginning of Wilson's second term in office, he asked Congress to declare war on Germany. The U.S. entered World War I on the side of the Allied powers. The additional support came at an important time. American soldiers were able to help resist German troops in France. In time, Germany asked for an armistice, an agreement to stop fighting. Following the war, Wilson had a grand vision for how to gain lasting peace in Europe. He proposed that the countries that had won the war not punish Germany. Wilson also wanted European colonies to rule themselves and other areas be given immediate independence. Most importantly, Wilson suggested a League of Nations that would guarantee the member countries independence and safety. But few world leaders agreed with his plan completely. Even in the U.S., many Republican lawmakers in Congress resisted Wilson's idea for a League of Nations. Some strongly objected to any treaty that would limit the country's independence. Others did not want the country to be involved in world issues at all. So Wilson began a trip across the U.S. to raise public support for the League of Nations. He traveled more than 15,000 kilometers in 22 days and gave 29 speeches. Wilson's doctors warned him that the trip was hard on his health, but Wilson was firm about pressuring Senate Republicans to adopt the agreement. Finally, he collapsed from exhaustion. Shortly after, he suffered a major stroke. Although he recovered somewhat, he remained partly paralyzed. He rarely appeared in public again. Instead, Wilson communicated to Congress through his wife. When Republicans changed the treaty to deal with their concerns, Wilson told his supporters to reject it. In the end, the U.S. never did join the League of Nations. When a new president, Warren Harding, was sworn in in 1921, Edith and Woodrow Wilson retired to a house in Washington, D.C. Three years later, the former president died quietly there, finally at peace. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans, and I'm Ashley Thompson.